Telling the stories of entrepreneurs and how they overcame the struggles and challenges to get where they are today. This is Believe in the Entrepreneur with Joel Sandoval, CPA. What's going on? Welcome to another episode of Believe in the Entrepreneur, and I'm super excited because I have Carly Meter here in the house, who's a partner and executive recruiter at Central Valley Search Partners. Carly, thanks for being on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. Awesome. I'm excited to be here. Awesome, awesome. So, Carly, we actually, you know, we go back, you know, actually we met when, you know, I had just graduated from Cal State University, Bakersfield, you know, young kid, just starting my accounting career, and you were just starting your career as an executive recruiter. Um, kind of, you know, and you also helped me, you know, grow into other positions as well. But Carly, why don't you start by telling me a little bit about, you know, who you are and how you got into this business? Yeah, so I have spent pretty much my entire professional career in recruiting. Um, Funny or ironic, I should say, is I have my bachelor's degree in criminal justice. Really? I have a minor in sociology, um, and then I have my associates in child development. Go figure. Um, But when I graduated from Cal State Bakersfield, I was kind of like a lot of other people, I feel like, you know, just not really knowing what direction you want to go in. Um, And I kind of started like with a general office administration, accounting background, working for my husband's family business. And um, I had a high school friend that I hadn't seen in years, and I had just gotten Facebook, and she was a recruiter. And she had reached out to me to try to recruit me for a client. And I'm not an accountant. Like, yes, I recruit for accounting, but I'm not an accountant. And so it was kind of one of those things where um, the firm she had worked with or worked for at the time had an opening. And she was kind of like, I think you'd be good at this. Like, you're a people person. You have the personality. And, you know, I'm like, okay, like, let's give it a shot. And here I am 10 years later and still loving what I do. So I literally fell into it. I mean, I never really knew what a headhunter or a recruiter did. I'd never worked with any, you know, any type of recruiter in the past, like, or in college or anything like that. So I never thought that this is what I would be doing, but now that I'm doing it, I definitely wouldn't imagine doing anything else. Right. So So, super blessed from that perspective. That's awesome. So how did you, I mean, you know, because you didn't really plan it out. You didn't say like, oh, I'm going to grow up and be a recruiter. Nope. I wanted to be a paralegal. Really? Yep. And in college, I worked for the city of Bakersfield for like two, three years. Um, and I worked for the city attorney's office for probably a year and a half to two years of that time frame. And so I got my degree in criminal justice with the um, intention of going on and becoming a certified paralegal. Well, this was back in 09, like when the bad recession happened. Right. Um, and Cal State Bakersfield had eliminated like all of their extended uh, studies, um, like program certification programs. And so it was kind of one of those things where, you know, I got married and had my daughter young and I wasn't in a situation to kind of like redirect my education and I had graduated. And so um, simultaneously, I had gotten laid off from the city because of like budget cuts and, you know, mm. all within that time frame. So it just didn't really work out in my favor, like as far as what my game plan was. And again, why I got my degree and what I did and all of that. But um, I'm a firm believer with my own story that everything certainly happens for a reason. <laughs> right. Yeah, I truly believe that. And I think that, you know, just when you go back and you just, it's just nature kind of working itself. Absolutely. And it's like, it was, you know, it was meant to be. No, it definitely was. I couldn't imagine doing anything different. I mean, I genuinely love what I do and I definitely feel like it fits me like personally. And um, I do like to share my story, especially when I interview a lot of young grads who are kind of in that situation where, They got their degree, but they may have not loved like their core classes or their major and don't really know like what direction to go into. And it's overwhelming, you know, like when you're in your early 20s and trying to like figure life out. And so um, I I am, I'm a firm believer when one door closes, another door opens. And sometimes you just have to 
be optimistic and give things a chance. And, you know, it can really just lead you down the correct path. Right. That's so interesting. And so how did you know that this was for you? Like, did you know as soon as you started that career, like, I love this or did you grow to love it? Oh, no, I loved it right away. Oh, really? So when I started, I actually did a year, year and a half of temp staffing. And in the temp world, it's super different than executive recruitment because it's very pa- fast paced and it's very high volume. And so temp staffing is basically representing candidates that are unemployed and available for immediate work. So you can have a client call you at 8 a.m. and need somebody to start by 1 p.m. after lunch or, you know, get 10 people lined up by that Friday or, you know what I'm trying to say? Right. It's like very, very fast paced and immediate. Right. And that's my personality. Like, and I think that's why accounting wasn't my thing because I'm not like a repetitive, like behind the desk type of person, you know, just kind of doing data entry or numbers. Right. Like, that's just not me. So it was really... From And I love people. So interacting with people, interviewing 20 people a day, on the phone all day, in between call, you know, it was just like super fast paced and it just really fit me. Right. So it, it was, it was kind of like an instant, instant fit. Nice. Mm-hmm. So how did you transition from the temp hiring to now the permanent hire? Like how did you make that transition? So there was quite a bit of turnover in my office at the time. And there was an opening for an executive recruiter. And so it was an easy transition because I had been with the with the company at this point for a good year and a half or so. And I knew the business. I understood the process Um, and so it was an opportunity that was, um, you know, available internally and, and I made the move over and it was, it was a really easy transition. So from a processing perspective, executive recruiting is very different though, because you're not a resume house. You more so represent candidates that are gainfully employed and very confidential and passive in their searches. So they're not sending you their resume or actively publicly applying to ads. It's more of poaching, cold calling, you know, directly targeting um, working individuals that meet the specific profile that your client is looking for. So it's a little bit different from that perspective. Right. It almost seems like it's opposite. Like, you know, temp hire is like, hey, you start at eight, you know, you got notice at eight in the morning and they need to be hired by 12 noon. But with executive recruiting, it's like they may not even be looking for an opportunity. Yeah. 95% of the people that we represent aren't. Wow. So it's more of, you know, a referral basis, getting names, you know, picking up the phone and talking to, you know, whoever you can get on the other line and, you know, introducing yourself and, um, presenting a position to them to see if they'd be interested, you know, things like that. So, but yeah, I mean, most of the people that we do end up identifying aren't looking most of the time they don't even have a resume available. So it takes a couple of days for them to, you know, put something together in order for us then to interview and, and that type of thing. Gotcha. Now, because I would imagine that this process, the executive recruiting process, is probably a slower process compared to the temp to hire or like the temp, you know, agency. So, and you mentioned like you're kind of fast paced. Yeah, that's a great point. It did take a little bit of time to kind of slow down because like, you know me, so I am a little bit like, you know, 100 miles per hour. So yeah, it did take a little bit of time to kind of like slow down and go with the process. Because yeah, I mean, it definitely doesn't happen overnight. If you feel like a, um, an, a search engagement, you know, within a week or two, like you're really lucky, you know, because right. it doesn't happen overnight, you know, it's especially for the level of, of type of positions that I do recruit for. Naturally, there's several interviews that are involved. And, you know, we have to accommodate everybody's work schedules and, you know, so on and so forth. So it's, it's a process. And before we even recommend a candidate to a client, you know, we have to interview them and reference check and, you know, so on and so forth. So it, yeah, it's a process. Was that uh, pretty easy for you to adapt to, or did you have to like maybe train your kind of like your personality in a way to like adapt to this new kind of slower process of hiring? A little bit of both, a little bit of both. I mean, it was not hard, but it was just more of, um, yeah, again, kind of going from that super fast pace to, you know, being patient more than anything. But um, I've been doing it for so long now that, you know, it's, 
it's easy now, but yeah, there is a little bit of a transition with that. For sure. And I think, you know, executive recruiters are kind of like an important role for just the economy because like, you know, most CEOs, like for me, where I'm at, or even people higher than me, like they're too busy running their business that they don't have time to sit down and review resumes. And and it's like, they can just rely on that, you know, like someone like you to really put someone in front of them to, you know, for the position that they're fulfilling. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's it's definitely a, a huge need. And then there's also like guarantees, you know, that I think, you know, kind of takes the risk away for a lot of employers. Yep. Uh, and it's kind of like a win-win situation for everybody, I think, for both the employer side as well as the employee. Uh, but tell me, you know, if someone, like, how do you find these candidates? Like, you know, you you kind of like, in a way, I, I kind of see you as a matchmaker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you how do you make that connection? And how do you find the your clients? And then how do you find the employees? Yeah, so again, I have an advantage considering I've been in the industry for as long as I have now, a lot of my new clients are referrals. And so I'm very blessed and thankful from that perspective. Um, and you know, the candidate side of it, it, it's, it's the same. This is a very relationship based business. You know, once you place somebody, it's not that you don't ever talk to them again. I mean, nine out of 10 people I place end up becoming a client and then I'm working with them on the hiring side of things. Right. So getting to know both both parties is really, really important. And that is how you successfully make those matches and those recommendations. And a lot of clients that um, I've had the privilege of partnering with, I've been doing business with them for years. And so they trust me. They know that I know the profile of person they're looking for. You know, somebody could look great on paper, but they're not the right cultural fit either. And and that's almost just as important, if not more, more important, right? And so um, obviously the, the more that relationship grows and the more I get to know somebody and the company and again, the type of person that fits in well within the organization, then as I'm identifying candidates on the contrary, um, I'm able to better make those recommendations, Um, so on the candidate side, it's, you know, again, it's a lot of, um, targeting specific companies, especially like competitors, um, or, um, within the industry, um, you know, LinkedIn is helpful, but it also only goes so far. We do kind of refer to LinkedIn as like being the Bible in the recruiting world, because like the, the information that's available is just wild, right? I mean, you can, unlock profiles. You can reach out to third connections that you aren't connected with. Um, you have so much information just readily available at your fingertips, but every recruiter uses it. So at the same time, it can only go so far. I'd say like the average accounting professional probably gets eight to 10 in mails a week. Right. So it's kind of like, what does my in mail say that eight other in mails don't say type of thing. Right. Mm. So we use LinkedIn more to get names and companies of people. And then we pick up the phone and directly cold call to, to poach those individuals, but also it's really using your network. And that's why I try to like be involved in different organizations within the community or, you know, have good, um, connections with CSUB or Fresno state, you know, that type of situation. Cause we're always, always looking for good referrals. And so most of the time, you know, I'll pick up the phone and reach out to people that I already know and not as a targeted candidate, but just like, Hey, I have this position. This is what I'm looking for. Do you know somebody? Oh yeah. You know, call so-and-so type of thing. Call that person. They may not be interested, but then they give me another name of a referral. Call that person. So it's definitely a process. If, if you get where I'm going at, you know, I could talk to 10 people and only one person's interested, Mm. but I got nine other names. Right. right? So that makes sense. Yeah. That's pretty cool. And I think what you actually said earlier, you I mean you hit so many points there, but one of the things that stood out to me is, you know, when you find someone that's a good culture fit. And for me, you know, as an accountant, like most accountants, they just like very introverted, don't really have a personality for the most part, like maybe a little bit outside of the company, but for the most part, it's very, very dry. And so I didn't really understand culture until I actually built my accounting firm and I had to find a way to retain my employees, retain my team members, what I like to call them. And the way I found out, because I lost people in the beginning, I didn't have a culture. It was, you know, pretty bad. 
and I improved it now. I'm like pretty now culture is one of the things that I'm very proud of. Mm -hmm. And I think that I've been able to retain my employees because of culture. Uh, but I didn't learn that until later. Right. So if someone, you know, what are some of the reasons, you know, when someone is, you know, unhappy or wants to pursue a new opportunity, I found that it's usually because of a culture, mm -hmm. you know, um, kind of a misalignment. So like, what are some of the things that, you know, you hear from candidates, like some of the complaints or some of the things that they're telling you? Yeah, I definitely agree. Culture is always a big part of it. Um, it's either that or management. Um, you know, having a work home life balance anymore is also really big, especially after COVID and everybody worked remote for so long. And I think that's been kind of enticing for a lot of companies that have never entertained, um, you know, the flexibility to work remote on a regular basis. But then when we were stuck having to do it, you know, it's kind of given people a new perspective, like, wow, like this works, right? So that's also been kind of a double-edged sword as we've gotten back into post-COVID because so many employees want that flexibility still with like a hybrid schedule or, you know, remote flexibility and that type of thing. And I mean, most local companies are not still offering, you know, full-time remote, but I think the flexibility in general and that home work-life balance also plays a really big part, especially for working professionals with, you know, young kids. I mean, you and I both know that it's super hard to work a standard 60 hours a week and have little ones at home. And, um, you know, the old saying, you know, you're overworked and underpaid type of thing. So I think those three things are usually the three, um, most common, um, uh, feedback I get as far as why people are looking and then also just feeling like they don't have like professional growth. But a lot of times that kind of falls under the lack of management because oftentimes there is, but it's not communicated until somebody goes and resigns. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're like, Oh my gosh, we were going to promote you. And you know, we have all these plans for you. And mm -hmm. it's kind of like, well, if you value that person, then they should have known their worth before mm. they're walking out the door, right? right? So you see that a lot. God, it's almost like a reactive approach versus a proactive Absolutely. approach. Absolutely, yeah. And it's it's it, I mean that that you can apply that to everything. Like I apply that in my you know tax business. Like that's one of the things that I think makes me um, competitive is that most CPAs are so busy that you know they don't really help their clients plan or help them reduce their tax liability. And it's just because they have too many clients or they're not structured in a way to, and so they're being reactive. Right. And then when clients leave, they usually come to us because they're like, oh, wow, you guys have a proactive approach. Mm -hmm. We're meeting with them on a quarterly basis to see what they can do to pay less in taxes where their previous CPA only met with them maybe once a year. Yeah. And it's the same thing in recruiting. It's like they're leaving because you didn't show them appreciation. Yeah. That management wasn't there. Now you're trying to show it at the end, but it's like, it's too late. Yeah. And that's a prime example of why counter offers don't work either. You know, it's really easy to throw more money at somebody that's leaving when, again, if they were valued and they were such an integral part of your accounting team or your company in general, then they should have been making more money to begin with. And again, knowing what their long-term potential in the company was and, and their worth. Because, I mean, no one wants to fill undervalued or, or anything like that. But again, it goes back to lack of management and most of the times just that not being communicated. 100%. And you know, you, you mentioned an interesting thing about, you know, COVID kind of changed things where people are now working remote. And now that it's post COVID, they kind of want that hybrid model. Yeah. Um, like for me, actually, um, COVID was a blessing because at that time I had outgrown this office that we're in and uh, I was looking for a bigger building. And I couldn't really find anything and COVID hit. And so some of my team members started working from home. So I pretty much bought laptops for almost everybody, but I still had some people here at the office. And I uh, actually did a survey. I sent it out to my team members like, hey, what do you guys prefer? The majority was a hybrid model, but then actions speak louder than words. And so I noticed that the people that have an office here only come whenever they need to. Mm -hmm. They don't even come here unless like they have a meeting with a client or they have to be in the office. Otherwise they're working from home. So I completely gave up the, you know, the goal of owning a bigger building because I didn't need it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> 
which reduced my overhead costs. And now I'm growing virtually, mm -hmm. which has allowed us to grow without adding overhead expense. Yeah. And, and, and then now we also have clients, you know, across different states. Uh, we're pretty much becoming a national firm because of our adaptability to become uh, virtual. Yeah. So that's, that's cool. That's awesome. That's pretty cool that you kind of recognize that same trend. Yeah. And again, I think it's just, you know, technology and everything so much more technical driven and automated anymore. I mean, we're really blessed, you know, for the resources we now have. It's more of a strong preference on the candidate side than I do say it is on the client side. But again, it companies are having to do a lot more in today's market with how competitive it is to help entice people. So again, you know, the average company or, you know, nine out of 10 of my clients, for example, are not doing regular hybrid scheduling or remote positions, but they're open to it for the right person. If somebody has the industry experience and, you know, meets really all the requirements on the job description, because they can't risk not you know, being attractive to that candidate in return. So it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, I mean, I, I don't think it will ever change at this point. In my opinion, I think like the hybrid and remote is, is here to stay, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but I just don't see that anymore. The biggest thing is, and this is always a big misconception is there are a lot of remote opportunities, but not with local companies. So what we're seeing right now is a lot of national corporations targeting our local market. Mm. So then candidates try to kind of use that as an incentive from a negotiation standpoint for like local opportunities, because again, there's a lot of remote um, opportunities targeting Kern County or the Valley in general, but those are not local companies that are targeting our local candidates, if that mm, makes sense. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So you can almost use like that remote um, position almost as a competitive advantage to obtain better talent. Yeah. Because now you, it's like, hey, they might not want to be commuting and they have an opportunity to work from home. And it just seems like an attractive opportunity, attractive position. Oh, yeah. I mean, we've gotten spoiled in Bakersfield. I mean, we don't really commute, right? I mean, especially with like Crosstown Freeway and stuff now, everything's 20 minutes. And so even getting people to drive to Delano anymore is like <laughs> nearly impossible because why would they when, yeah, they could either take something that's hybrid or remote or find something in town, you mm -hmm. know? So... Um, yeah, I mean, and again, I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier, though, is just having that flexibility and that work home life balance. And everybody really got to experience that with COVID when, you know, we were forced to have to work from home and remote, but everybody got so used to that, that it's hard to like make that transition back. I gotcha. Now I have a question because you're, you're pretty much, you know, you're an executive, a recruiter, but also a partner, mm -hmm. right? So you understand entrepreneurship and if you know an entrepreneurship, there's no such thing as work-life balance. Right. <laughs> right. You, you, you pretty much like, you know, especially for me, like I'm always, you know, my mind's just always working. Even if I'm at home, I have to like tell myself to stop and focus on my daughters. Like I know you have horses at home and, you know, I'm not sure if you, you have that same kind of bug in my, that I do. So um, how do you like since you kind of know both sides, you also see the candidate side that's like, hey, you know, I'm, I feel undervalued. How do you interpret work-life balance? Well, again, I think it goes back to like prioritizing and, and having that flexibility because if I'm out of the office, for example, no one would know because I have my phone on me. I check my email every 10 seconds. I don't miss a call. If I miss a call, I call them back like that same business day. So it's uninterrupted, right? But then on the other side of it, like I don't miss out on anything with my daughter or my family or extracurricular activities or, you know, what I have to do outside of my office. Um, I, I work a lot from home as well outside of standard business hours, but it's also different being an employee versus being a business owner. And it doesn't shut off in my opinion when you're an owner, but it's just different because again, you kind of have more of that flexibility to take care of things if you aren't physically in your office at work. Right? right. So I have a home office and stuff and I have everything set up there. And again, like 
when I leave the office and something has to be done by the time I get home, nothing's ever uninterrupted. Right. So. I think that flexibility is key because if you have flexibility, it almost seems like you need less work-life balance mm -hmm. because if you're able to, you know, be at home, enjoy that moment with your kids or whatever it is, but at the same time, like, oh, my, my employer is allowing me to, you know, work from home yet I'm still, I'm getting my job done, but at the same time, I'm not missing out on this opportunity where yep. if you're like, you're stuck in a cubicle, you're like, wow. I'm, and then you almost have resentment. Yeah. Well, and there's some companies that still like, you know, you're designated your hour lunch and you clock in and clock out. And if you have to leave early, you have to give, you know, 48 hour notice for pre-approval. And, you know, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but for most people, like that's difficult, especially when you do have young kids and it's hard to make sure like you're at two places at once, right? I had an experience um, with a company that I worked for like right out of college um, when I was doing like general accounting and it was in the oil and gas industry. And at the time, my daughter was like a year old. And um, I had just left my husband's family business to take like my first job. And uh, my daughter's daycare called and she was sick and had to get picked up early. And I was doing like oil and gas billing for um, Arrow was like my main client. And so it was daily billing. You had to have everything in, you know, by the end of the day, no exceptions type of thing. And I will never forget that when I went into my boss's office, to ask if I could leave early to go pick up my sick one-year-old daughter, she told me no, because my work wasn't done for the day. Like your bills need to be tied out before you can leave. And that like really, I mean, this was 11 years ago, 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I will never forget that because I, it like took my breath away in this sense where it was like, wow, like I really had to choose between my daughter and my job. Right? right. But I couldn't afford to walk out because I had to work, right. you know, and that always has really resonated with me. And I feel for people that are in those type of situations because we all have to work at the end of the day. Right? right. And to ever like feel like you have to make that decision between your job and your family, I think is horrible. 100%. You know? I can relate to that. And actually, we were talking a little bit about this before the show. Like I had that same experience for me. Um, I was working right before I started my firm, Sound of All Tax CPAs. I was working for for the man, and I remember it was Friday clock, Friday Friday evening, six o'clock, and I had to run a quick errand that um, was very important to me. But it was only going to take 30, 45 minutes, and I was going to come back to the office and get my job done by the end of the day. Well, I go come back, and I he uh, my boss asked me at the time, "Hey, where um, where's the reports that I need?" And I'm like. I'll have them to you in the next, you know, hour. He's like, these should have been done by now. Why are they not done? I said, oh, I just had to run a quick errand, but I'll get it done. And he said, wrote me a nasty text message saying, never effing let uh, your priority come before my business. And that just sunk in. And I was in that same position as you were, where it's like I had to almost choose between my personal life, which I thought was very important, and my job. Mm -hmm. And I was like... I didn't feel, I felt undervalued. I felt like this is, and I remember showing that text message to my wife. And when I showed it to her, I had started thinking about entrepreneurship, but I never had really the guts to do it. But that text message gave me the courage yeah, because I was so upset and I was so felt so unappreciated, so undervalued that I ended up putting my two weeks notice that that next day, Saturday, and then Monday, Monday morning comes, uh, I already had sent the email. So my boss comes in, hands me my last check and yeah. today's your last day, but it couldn't have been the best. It was literally what I've known. It's now the blessing, yeah. but, but at the time I was heartbroken and I was mm -hmm. so under, I felt so undervalued. And I think that some employers almost forget to, like you said, management, you know, show appreciation, show that you value your team members because yeah. the last thing you want is to almost regret, you know, the fact that you didn't show appreciation. Yeah. It's like, I mean, that happens in marriage too. Yeah. No, it does. And, you know, I'd be a hypocrite to say if I could give anybody advice like on having a homework life balance, because it's different for everybody. And I will admit that when I was younger in my career and, and as a recruiter, and you could see, you know, kind of the success that's there and 
you know, the commission and, you know, the financial incentive that naturally kind of gave me more fire to want to do better and put the extra work in because I saw the reward. Right. And again, I would be lying if I didn't choose my career over my family, like the first probably four or five years of my career, I worked all the time to the point where I was also taken advantage of though, you Mm. know? And so I think there's a difference between, um, well, for me, it's all about really prioritizing, you know, if, if, if I'm, if I have an offer pending and I have a call coming in at nine or 10 o'clock at night, I will not miss that call. Right. But if it's some person that I, you know, is not priority or I hadn't heard from for a couple months prior and they're calling me at eight or nine o'clock at night, I don't need to take that call, right? I can call them back when I get into the office in the morning. Right. So there's a difference there, right? You know, because I mean, people would call me six o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock at night. I mean, you know, and then it kind of clicked on me where as my daughter got older, she would tell me like, get off your phone, stop working. Like Mm. you're always on your phone, you know, but it became so habit like Mm. that it it was, it was just constant. Like it gave me anxiety to think like if I missed an email or, I mean, I would respond like, you know, and I still do, but I feel like I'm better as far as prioritizing what has to be taken care of right away. And again, what's going to still be there at 830 in the morning when I'm back in the office. Right. You know, there's a difference. Yeah, so. I think knowing your priorities is so important. And actually, in the, in the, we have a morning meeting every um, at 9 a.m. every morning. And I tell my team members, like, actually reprioritize every single hour of the day because there's going to be phone calls that come up, right? And so you might lose tr- focus on your priorities. Yeah. And, and the same thing happens at home. So it's like, Cause I get the same, same thing. My, my daughter's like, Hey, time to turn your phone off. My, my wife will tell me the same thing. Hey, time to turn your, your phone off. And I'm, as you've seen, you know, active on social media. So I'm like, want to post stuff. And I, and I have to like almost remind myself, Hey, just be present in the moment. And what is priority right now? Yeah. And if you focus on, it's like, okay, if right now the time is to focus on my daughters, let's do that. Yeah. And then I will get back to that email as soon as they go to sleep, as yeah. soon as they go to bed. Yeah. And as cliche as it sounds, you know, I mean, it does go by super fast. I mean, my daughter was not even two when I started in the industry and she's 12 now. And it seems like just yesterday they were your girls as age, or she was your girls as age, you know? So I don't regret anything, but again, like I do look back and again, I would not be being honest if I didn't say like, I definitely chose my career over my family like earlier on, but I think like anything else, like with professional maturity and just again, reprioritizing things, it's easier to kind of help find that balance, but it's hard. And especially now as an owner, you can't really ever turn it off. 100%. So, yeah, I think you, you made it, you know, you made a great point there because, you know, it's very easy to just get sucked into, you know, the financial reward that you almost forget to, you know, pay attention to your loved ones and Mm -hmm. stuff. But, you know, it's interesting because I get a lot of crap from family members like, hey, you work too much, Joel. Like, you know, you're always on your phone posting or you're always working. You know, you always want to get to that next level. Like, when is enough enough? And I kind of look back because as a child, my mom was actually, I consider her like a workaholic. She still is. But I love her to death. And I think I really believe in leading by example. And I think that I am a hard worker because my, my mom is a hard worker. Yeah. And I just consume what, what I saw as a kid. So it's ironic you say that because, as you know, I lost my mom three years ago from breast cancer. And I have a sister, so I'm not an only child like my daughter is. But my mom, up until she couldn't work anymore once her cancer, like, took over and she became terminal, she retired from the state of California. She worked at Caltrans for, like, over 30 years, and she was a high-profile district manager And I, you know, as kids though, you don't really maybe understand fully what your parents do. And I certainly never thought like, I wonder what my parents make, you know, like that was just like, I don't know. I never thought of anything like that, but I knew as I got older and in my adulthood, you know, understanding and respecting what my mom actually did. Right. So while she was also, you know, high profile in her job, She was on the school board for 16 years. She was president of our 4-H club. I grew up in Bishop, California, like up by Mammoth. And 
we had the privilege of, you know, kind of doing everything from like extracurricular activities because it wasn't like here, like as far as there's one school or two schools, you know, like K through eight in high school, but you went from one sport to the next, right? Year round. And it wasn't like you had to play club in order to make your school team. Like, you know what I'm trying to say? So I played sports year round. I actively had, you know, my horses. I always did 4-H. Um, my mom, you know, was the PTA. I mean, she did everything. And we had a home cooked meal every single night and we ate as a family. And it's little things like that. Like obviously as a kid, you don't know the difference, but I look back and I am like, how did she do that? Cause I only have one child. Right. And that is one thing I've had to kind of give up is, you know, I was on the board of directors for a nonprofit in town. And, um, I was a lot more involved in some like different type of community and like board presence and stuff. But I'm at a point in my life right now where, again, just prioritizing and what makes sense. I've kind of given some of that stuff up since a, since COVID um, because my daughter's in sixth grade now and she's super busy and very active. And, you know, again, it's like you it's the, the reward is not worth missing that kind of stuff when it comes to your family at the end of the day. Yeah, 100 percent. And one of the things that I've learned, too, that it's more about quality than it is about quantity. Yep. It's like, as long as you're there with the little time that you have, if you devote 100% of your attention to your loved one, whether it's your daughter or your spouse, and you're present in that moment, it's like, it just makes up for all that lost time. Yep, absolutely. And I think that, you know, it, you know, and, it, and you know, it, it's, it's interesting because my mom still is like, one of her regrets is like, oh, I should have spent more time with you, you know, as you were growing up. And I'm like, mom, you didn't have to. Like you were the best example yeah. to me that you could have been. Like I would not have wanted to change anything about it. Yeah. I and feel I, the same way. It's so ironic you bring that up because that really is such an example. And I feel like my sister and I 110% got our worth, work ethic from my mom, you know. And again, you don't realize it as a, as a child, but she absolutely led by example. And my sister's a business owner in town as well. Um, she owns Uniquely Chic Florist and she just had her 15th anniversary, I want to say in March. And she is the hardest worker I know. Like it's unbelievable. Right. Like she runs circles around me and I do consider myself to be a hard worker. (laughs) Right. Yeah. But it's just, that's how we were raised. Right. You know, we didn't have things handed to us. I lived a blessed, normal life by all means, but I didn't have, you know, I, I've earned where I'm at. Right. You know, and there's a difference. I think there's a difference with a sense of appreciation when you've earned something versus something just being given to you. 100%. And it's interesting, like you said, as a kid, you don't realize this stuff, right? But it's almost like the subconscious mind is almost more powerful than the actual mind because the subconscious mind is is just observing all these things as a kid and you don't realize anything. And then you're like, you realize that you're more like your mom or your dad than you thought you ever would be. Yep. (laughs) And it's just because you were just around them the whole time and your subconscious mind was consuming all this content. Yeah. And, and that's why, you know, speaking of content, that's why my social media presence, I'm just trying to put myself in everybody's subconscious mind Mm -hmm. because before they know it, it's like, they're thinking about you and then you end up becoming like them. And that's to me what it's social media influence Mm -hmm. is just, you know, impacting the lives of others without you even having to, you know, really speak to them because they're just consuming that content as a kid that you don't realize that you're going to end up being like your parents. And that's, you know, I see it in you, you know, you said, you know, you, ever since I've met you, it's like you're working 24 mm-hmm. seven. And then when you're talking about work-life balance, I'm like, and it is when there's a financial reward, it almost is non-existent but i think when you have that flexibility and you prioritize it's like you're gonna feel fulfilled oh yeah absolutely and i feel like i i'm i get the best of both worlds right because i have very much an active life outside of central valley search partners but again like if i wasn't in the office you wouldn't know that if you were a client because i'm available you know you're not waiting on me i'm fulfilling my obligation you know just that type of thing but i think that's also what candidates want anymore especially you know when it comes to kids and family and all that like i will get the job done but it's nice if it's not you know just between 8 and 5 right so that's really where a lot of that 
comes from on the candidate side and kind of going back to your question, you know, as far as like why people are not happy in their current situations. And that's a big, that's a big one. 100%. So how do you like for me when I'm like, cause you said that your clients don't even know that you're not in the office because uh, if you're just available, but I put myself in that situation and like, I always have to like, if, if I have to take care of business, I almost like, cause my daughters will be like, dad, dad, dad. And they're just pulling my hand. And it's like, right now I'm in work mode. Like, please. So how do you avoid distractions or noise, background noise when you're, since you're available almost 24 seven? Well, I'm just kind of honest. <laughs> I'm, like, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm riding my horse right now, but I didn't want to miss your call, you uh, know, and sometimes they laugh and they're like, it's totally fine. Call me back in an hour. But mm. I think again, it's like what, what makes sense and how you need to handle something. Like if I have a CFO calling me, I'm not going to answer the call while there is absolutely any distractions. Like I will call them back immediately, but in a room or a, a quiet place. Like, so it's kind of within reason, like what's appropriate and what's not. But just generally speaking, you know, again, having the flexibility, you would never know as far as the type of work I do, taking care of business, whether it's outside of hours or I'm not physically in the office. Right. And I think, I think what you said is that you're honest, right? So you're transparent from the very beginning. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's like there's no surprises. And I think that we're all human. So we know that you're going to spend time with your family or extracurricular activities, whether it's horseback riding yeah. or for me, I don't know what my extracurricular activities are anymore, but, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know, it, you know, we're all human and we can all understand that we all need a life outside of work. So yeah. as long as you're transparent, it's like, Hey, we don't mind the background noise, you know. You need to get an extra extracurricular activity, Joel. <laughs> I honestly, I I did not have one for a very long time, especially you know after having my daughter and again being super wrapped up in work. Right. And um, my husband has always been active, like playing sports. Like he plays roller hockey, ice hockey, so slow pitch softball. Like he's always had his outlets. He golfs regularly. And I had nothing besides like my job and being a mom, which are the two best rewards. But I think everybody needs to have that separation from both worlds. And I did not have that for the first couple of years. Mm. And it was really hard on me without really realizing it. And as I mentioned, like I grew up riding horses my whole life. Um, I got out of it like for about 14 years or so. And I had been talking about really getting back into it for probably three or four years, but I had every excuse. Like I don't have time. They're expensive, you know, whatever. And then one day I literally went out and just bought a horse. Like I didn't even have any tack or anything. I just went and bought the horse and then kind of was like, I'm, if I don't do it, I'm not going to do it. Right. So anyways, that's my outlet mm. and it is a big commitment, but I think it's so important that everybody does something, whether that's right. going to the gym or whatever. I think it's so important that we all have that separation outside of, you know, mom, wife, husband, father, and our careers. Right. right. So. Yeah. I think that's a good point because we all need to recharge. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, and it's very easy to like, just drain your batteries. If you're just, you know, always working and always like chasing that next dollar. Yeah. But, um, you, you do need to separate. And now that you mention it, I'm like, Oh, I actually do have extracurricular activities. I just don't make the time for them. And until you say, you know, I just got to do it mm -hmm. and make the time for it. And it's like, and it just fills up your cup. Like for me, I would say it's probably like just traveling. I love traveling, kind of seeing other parts of the world or just being in a different Airbnb, seeing different walls, different ocean, different. Yeah. It's just like, wow, I didn't realize like I'm just stuck in this office 24 seven. And it's like, there's more to life than there's a whole nother world. Out yeah. Here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think that's so important that we, we take the time to do that, especially when we're just working, you know, all the time. Yeah. Cause it doesn't stop, you right. know, and even going back to like the COVID conversation, you know, and when we when I first, uh, when we first opened Central Valley Search Partners, we worked from home remote, like for the first six months, just to kind of like get on our feet and all of that. And that was super challenging for me because I couldn't turn it off. Like mm. I didn't have another office to go to outside of my home. Mm. And so I, you know, I was working 
all the time, but without realizing it, it was like not good at this, at the right. same time, you know? So having that outlet, whatever that means for, you know, you or me or whatever, like, I think it's really important. Yeah. I think a lot of people realize that during COVID, like even my barber, for example, my barber, he, um, you know, he was just working haircut after haircut every 30 minutes, like nonstop. And then he, he told me when I was, he was cutting my hair, like post COVID, He's like, now I've stretched out my, um, my barbershop appointments to like 45 minutes. He's like, what's the hurry? It's like, now I I just want to like enjoy life. He's just like, Mm -hmm. but he didn't, he didn't realize how fast paced he was going, like just trying to get as many haircuts in as as fast as possible until COVID hit. And then he was basically forced to shut down. He was cutting a little bit of hair at his house, but you know, he was only with clients that he trusted and stuff. So it wasn't until that hit where it's like, hey, what am I, what else, what else in life is there? It's so, yeah, I love that you bring that up because that's how I felt. Like, I think that COVID for everybody made us all slow down, right? right? And you don't realize how on the go you are and how hectic and exhausting our schedules constantly are because you just have to do it, right? Like, there's no if ands, or buts about it. But then when you're forced to have to stay home and there's literally nowhere to go or anything to do, for me personally, that really made me reevaluate like, wow, like, you know, something kind of has to give a little bit. Right. Um, so again, that's why for me, I've been trying to be more disciplined and again, going back to the flexibility and just prioritizing and stuff. So I can maintain like the best of both worlds. 100%. That's awesome. So for you, Carly, like, what are you looking forward to? Like, what's, what do you kind of like have planned out for the next couple of years? Like, what are you excited about? Well, we have been super blessed. So to kind of give more of like a formal introduction, um, I'm one of the partners at Central Valley Search Partners and my partner is Randy Frank and Randy and I have worked together now like going on eight years. And so we have a great working relationship. Um, We're very close personal friends at the end of the day. Um, And we just had our third year anniversary as business owners. And so... um, Really, at the end of the day, like we've been super blessed with the f- the support and the success that we've had. Um, our end goal is not to become like the biggest firm in town and have a ton of employees. I mean, honestly, we want to keep it small and intimate and be able to continue to decide who we want to work with. And, you know, we're thankful we don't have to work with just any company that calls in or it's not a numbers game anymore. Um, so I think ultimately just, you know, keeping the success and the growth of our business, um, within reason is, is kind of like our plan. Um, you know, Randy has young kids, as I mentioned, my daughter's 12 and sixth grade, um, and kind of just, you know, maintaining, having the flexibility to make our families a priority, but then, you know, continually to have a successful firm at the end of the day as well. That's exciting. And congratulations on your three-year anniversary. Yeah, thank you. That's super it flew awesome. By. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So I think for, you know, if someone is looking for, you know, you know, executive assistant position or any position, you know, make sure to reach out to Carly. She's available on LinkedIn under Carly Meter. Also, she has a website, cvsearchpartners.com, and you, you offer a guarantee. And I, you know, I couldn't say nice, you know, enough nice things about you. Um, you've been a blessing, um, you know, in my life, and it's been an honor really just having you as a friend, um, as a partner in, you know, in life and in business. Well, thank you. And I really sincerely feel the same. I'm so proud of you, and I just wish you nothing but continued success, you know, I don't know if you remember this conversation you and I had, but I remember I was talking to you about an opportunity years ago, probably nine, 10 years ago. And you were like, yeah, like, you know, I'll take it for now, but like, I want to be my own boss. Like I want to be a business owner. Like I'm not into this for the long haul type of thing. Like I have plans and I'm kind of like, okay, got no problem. (laughs) And then to see what you've done with it really, like as a business colleague and knowing you personally, like you've killed it. And, oh, thank you. And, I, and congratulations. Thank you so yeah, much. You've, Carly. Done, you've done a great job. And I think it all comes down to that work ethic. And I think we have shared that in common. Yeah. So congratulations to you as well. Thank you, Joel.